Well, brothers and sisters, today marks part uh, seven of our series on the nature and character of God. As you may have gathered from uh, the announcements earlier on, because I am on holidays for the next couple of weeks, our little series or our big series will be uh, suspended for a couple of weeks and then we'll pick up where we left off in a uh, couple of, uh, in three Sundays from now. In the meantime, brothers and sisters, we are looking at the characteristics of God, uh, his mercy, truthfulness, and wisdom today. Mercy, truthfulness, and wisdom. And, and just like the last time when we talked about three characteristics all at once, uh, it is a big, um, a big chunk of information and thought and belief and biblical knowledge to digest. But also, just like last time, we will allow, hopefully, the Holy Spirit uh, to, to help us to chew on and meditate upon uh, whatever God has for us in his scriptures and in his word. This morning, uh, we want to, as always, take a moment to uh, give credit where credit is due. We thank Karen Sari, the creator of the Infographics Bible, for allowing us the opportunity to use this particular graphic on the nature and character of God uh, for, for me to allowing me to recreate it. Uh, we are just very grateful for that, as always. Also, as always, we want to remember that when we look at the nature and character of God, we are keeping that within the context of God's love and his holiness and perfection. And so as we zoom in on that, and as we look at the first Bible passage, which talks about God's mercy, we remember always that it is in that, that context. Well, just like uh, last time we talked about three characteristics, not this past sermon, but the one before that, when we talked about three characteristics of God, they fit roughly in what the theologians would call the moral characteristics of God. These three characteristics, God's mercy, <coughs> excuse me, his uh, truthfulness, and his wisdom. Our first passage uh, looks particularly at God's mercy, as I mentioned, and this is what Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 says. This is uh, Paul's letter to the people, uh, the Christ followers in the city of Ephesus, and Paul says to these Christ followers, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Mercy. In order to truly understand the mercy of God, we need to also understand uh, our, own, our own sinfulness, our own brokenness apart from God. We need to understand the state in which God uh, found us, as it were, when God sent his son Jesus to live among us. And understanding how desperately we were lost in our transgressions, as Paul puts it in that passage that we just read, understanding how desperately we were lost can help us to understand 
why it is that God sent Jesus not only to live and talk and walk with us and to heal us and to be with us, but also why God sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. If we, if we look at that question, if we narrow in on the question of why the cross, why did Jesus have to die on the cross? We see that the scriptures answer that question in a few different ways, not because the scriptures disagree with each other, but rather because these things are all part of a mosaic of reasons for why Jesus needed to come and die on the cross for us. Why Jesus not only needed to come and die on the cross for us, but also why Jesus need to, needed to rise from the dead for us and ascend into heaven for us as well. <clears throat> but particularly as we look at the question, why the cross, the Bible speaks of uh, five different reasons really, when you look at it. And you can, you can um, split those things up um, and look at how often the Bible speaks about each of those things as sort of one of the purposes for the cross. And, and they are these. Jesus came and died on the cross for the purpose of reconciliation, freedom, victory, cleansing, and amnesty. And what are those things? Uh, those things are this. Uh, reconciliation. Humanity had broken off their relationship with God. So God restored his relationship with humanity through the cross, through Jesus. For freedom. Why the cross for freedom? You see, humanity was enslaved and or being ransomed, depending on the particular passage, we were being ransomed and enslaved by Satan and by sin, and, and God came to free us from that. His son Jesus came to pay the ransom and to free us from slavery, to redeem us from enslavement. Also, Jesus came for victory. There were enemies who were out to destroy us, primarily, of course, Satan and his minions. They were out to destroy humanity, both humanity in the largest sense of the word and also each individual human. And so Jesus won the war for us. Without him and without his death on the cross, our, our cause in this war was hopeless. The Bible also talks about how God saw our wrongs and our sins, all the, all the ick, in our lives, he saw that as stains on who we are, right? God is a God who is holy and perfect, we've talked about. And so anything that is not holy and perfect is, is blemished and broken and wrong. And so because of Jesus, God's precious blood in Jesus Christ, his son, those stains are washed away. And lastly, as we talk about this, God provides amnesty for us through Jesus Christ. Our, our, it, it was like basically all of humanity, every person together as a, as, a, as a whole, but also us as individuals, it is like we were war criminals. Every single one of us. We had all rebelled against our rightful Lord and King. And our list of offenses was enormous. And so God, as judge, through the acts of Jesus on the cross, fully acquitted 
humanity. So in other words, if we look at those things, if we look at those categories and we, we summarize them and we say, in short, why the cross? What is the short answer to that? It is because God is merciful. That is why the cross. That is what all of those things, reconciliation, freedom, victory, amnesty, cleansing, all of those things are really rooted in God's mercy for us. We needed mercy in all of those areas, and nothing else would do. Moving on and looking at God's truthfulness, we come to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. <clears throat> and here we need to be clear for a moment that Jesus is speaking of himself. He's going to say uh, that he is the truth, among other things. Um, and, and that is speaking about himself as the Son of God. However, Jesus also makes it clear that if you know him, that is Jesus, then you also know the Father because they are the same. And so although Jesus says, I am the truth, it is clear from this passage as we look at it that it is no less true that God also is the truth. That's probably too many repetitions of the word truth there, but Hopefully you get what is meant there. Listen to what Jesus says as John records it about himself and about who he is. Do not let your hearts be troubled. He is speaking to his disciples. Do not be, let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so... Wouldn't I have told you that I am, would I have told you, excuse me, that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare, prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place I am going. Of course, Jesus is speaking about going to be with the Father, to live with him forever, to be in the presence of God forever. Thomas said to him, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. <laughs> From now on, you do know him and have seen him. See, Jesus claims to be the very image of God the Father. And, and, and that's true. Elsewhere in the scriptures, we hear uh, the Apostle John writing that, that Jesus really is the Word of God. Jesus is the expression of everything that God the Father is. And so the, the character of God the Father and the character of God the Son are one and the same. They are distinct persons, and that gets into the whole Trinity thing that we talked about earlier. They are distinct persons, but yet their character is absolutely synonymous with each other's character. And so when Jesus claims to be the truth and the way and the life— then we know for certain that so too the Father is the truth as well. And this is so important for us. If God was not truthful, if God was not the truth, then 
what hope could there possibly be for us? God would be ultimately unreliable. God would be not someone whose promises we could trust. God would be not someone whom we could believe. We would not be able to rely on the scriptures as telling us truthful things about God because it could all be lies for all we know. But that is not the God whom we serve. There is ample evidence throughout the scriptures and hopefully for you and I, as the Holy Spirit lives within us, we see the testimony of God's truthfulness within our own lives as well. But not only within the scriptures and within our own lives, but also in the lives of countless people countless faithful people who have lived in ages gone by, we can see God's truthfulness. Just as a little example, a little but important example, there are, uh, there are at least 14 different incidences where uh, infertile parents within the scriptures have deeply desired children, and God has made promises to them that they will have children. And in every single one of those 14 cases where God promises that they will have children, they do. They are given children. See, God promises to them, and those promises are proven to be true and to be reliable. God is truthful. Elsewhere, other times, God makes no such promise. It's not like God makes a blanket promise that every infertile couple will have children at some point or another. In these specific instances, God makes promises to particular people which bear out fruit. But either way, whether God makes the promise for a child to an infertile couple, or whether God makes no such promise, either way, God is proven truthful. This, of course, is just one example among many, many examples. Time and time again, God's promises are proven to be true. Not only that, of course, but God is wise. God is wise. In Isaiah chapter 28, verses 23 to 29, we read these words. Listen and hear my voice, says Isaiah. Pay attention and hear what I say. When a farmer plows for planting, does he plow continually? Does he keep on breaking up and working the soil? When he has leveled the surface, does he not sow caraway and scatter cumin? Does he not plant wheat in its place, barley in its plot, and spelt in its field? His God instructs him and teaches him the right way. Caraway is not threshed with a sledge, nor is the wheel of a cart rolled over cumin. Caraway is beaten out with a rod and cumin with a stick. Grain must be ground to make bread, so one does not go on threshing it forever. The wheels of a threshing cart may be used to roll over it, but one does not use horses to grind grain. All this also comes from the Lord Almighty, whose plan is wonderful, whose wisdom is magnificent. Now, brothers and sisters, not being a farmer myself, I do not know how many of those techniques and, and specifics are being used still today. I don't even... I don't even really know whether any of our farmers in our area plant spelt or cumin or caraway. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. 
And I don't think, I'm pretty sure, that not very many of our farmers, if any, um, use a, um, a horse or anything else to pull uh, the threshing cart or anything like that. Uh, though We have different techniques, but that's not the point of what Isaiah is saying. What Isaiah is saying is that all this knowledge and wisdom, knowledge and wisdom that may look a little different today, but all the knowledge and wisdom that humanity has gained has ultimately come from God. It is God who teaches us these things. It may not seem that way. It may seem like somebody like Isaac Newton came up with the theory of gravity when that apple beamed off his head, whether that's true or not, who knows. But really, ultimately, who is it who gave Isaac Newton the brains that he had? Who is it who made him inquiring? Who is it who inspired all the people before him to lead up to the possibility for Newton to explore gravity and so on? All the knowledge, all the true knowledge that exists in the world that human beings have is granted ultimately by God alone. But of course, wisdom goes beyond simple knowledge of farming techniques or gravity, the laws of gravity. Wisdom goes beyond those things. Listen to what Proverbs 26 verses 4 and 5 says. This is one of my favorite little passages in the Bible. And I would really encourage you to look it up and see for yourself that this is actually exactly what the Bible says. Proverbs 26, verse 4 says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Proverbs 26, verse 5 says, Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. So which is it? What are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to answer a fool according to his folly or not? What should we do? That's the beauty of wisdom literature. Wisdom literature goes beyond pure, simple knowledge and into the realm of wisdom. In order to truly understand this passage, you need to get beyond, we need to get beyond the simple facts and mull over, think about what the right thing to do is in a given context. Clearly, the writer of Proverbs is not so crazy that he's actually believing that people ought to both answer a fool according to their folly and not answer a fool according to their folly. Clearly, there is wisdom that is required here. And this is where our God is so, well, to be honest, God is so far beyond us in every area. But in, in particular for this morning, with regards to wisdom, God's wisdom is so far beyond our own that he can understand not only precisely when to answer a fool according to his folly and precisely when not to, but our God understands things so far beyond that that his uh, foolishness is wiser than anything that a human being could possibly think. And we're going to have to unpack that for a minute. But 1 Corinthians 1 verse 25 says this, Paul writing to the people of Corinth, he says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And Paul is not saying here to the people of Corinth that God is ever really actually weak or foolish, 
But rather, Paul is saying to them, hey, look, even if you were to be able to say, which you can't, but even if you were able to say that some decision or action of God's was less wise than some other decision or action of God, even if you were able to say that, it would still be that his most foolish action is wiser than the wisest human action. Right? Indeed. Anything that might appear to us to be foolish or weak coming from God, from our standpoint, is actually just an indication of our own foolishness and weakness, not God's. God is ultimately wise. God is all wise. So as with every week, we have to ask ourselves the question, what does God's mercy, truthfulness, and wisdom mean for us? Well, first of all, and we've touched base with this a couple of times throughout this message, we need to remember that ultimately God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. We know this because God's mercy and wisdom and truthfulness have testified throughout the scriptures, throughout our own lives, and throughout the lives of countless saints before us that God is reliable and trustworthy. God is not capricious. God is not a liar. God does not change. God is who God is always and forever. God can be trusted. I have said often to, to myself and to others that there are, there are sort of four groups of people or beings who can speak into your life in some way through actions or words or deeds or whatever, right? Um, there is yourself. You speak to yourself about yourself, right? And about all kinds of other things too. There's yourself and there are other people, of course. Other people say things to you about you all the time and other people speak various things all the time, right? Um, and there is Satan, of course. Satan tries to speak into our lives through words and deeds all the time, right? And, of course, fourthly, there is God. God speaks into our lives through his scriptures, through his spirit working in us, through the testimony of, of wise brothers and sisters in Christ. God speaks to us through creation and so on. Now, of those four groups, myself, other people, Satan, and God, who is the most reliable? Who is the one who is most likely to be telling the truth? God, of course. And so if other people tell me that I am worthless, not that that happens particularly often, thanks be to God, if other people tell me that I am worthless by implication or by outright saying it, if God tells me that I am worth a whole lot, I am worth sending his son to die for, God's got to be right. If I tell myself that I am stupid and lazy and good for nothing, but God says that I am his beautiful creation, fearfully and wonderfully made in his image to do the good things that he has laid out in advance for me to, good and that, to do and that he has equipped me with every good thing required to do those things. If God tells me that and I have told me something else, which of us is telling the truth? God. If Satan bombards me with ideas about how great it would be to live a life of worship to my own pleasure or worship to money or power or whatever, and God says, no, 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 
you need to worship me only, God only, which of them is going to be telling the truth? God. So this is the first thing that we need to remember about God's truthfulness and wisdom and mercy, that God is reliable and trustworthy. The second thing that we need to really pull out of this is that we, as God's image bearers, as, as we've talked about in all of these messages so far, we as God's image bearers, and in the context of love and holiness and perfection granted to us by God through Jesus Christ, we can grow in our truthfulness and mercy and wisdom. We can learn more and more when and how to speak truths that may be hard for people to hear, how to do that in love and in truth and in wisdom and in mercy. We can learn how to receive hard truths spoken to us. We can learn more and more how to wisely and mercifully and truthfully speak the love of God through our actions and through our words. And we can learn about how to speak about things that have remained hidden for far too long, those things that we sweep under the carpet, the elephant in the room, we can learn to speak in love, mercy, truth, righteousness, holiness, and justice. We can learn to speak and act about those things in a way that honors God and is wise and truthful and merciful too. We can learn how to lovingly, truthfully, wisely, and mercifully navigate the waters of theological differences, something that our denomination has not always been very good at. But not only, of course, any, not only, of course, theological differences, but political differences, ideological differences, interpretive differences, all of those things, even taste differences we can learn to navigate those things with, with wisdom. God will teach us those things. We, of course, have our own free will. We can choose to listen and grow more readily or not. We can resist the work of the Holy Spirit in us in teaching us to grow in these things, but God wants to teach us wisdom and truthfulness and mercy. And he will do so. And a great place to start is to look at the wisdom literature, to look at Proverbs. Take time and read through them. Don't try and read through all of Proverbs at once. Just take a little chunk at a time. But you can also, of course, find even greater wisdom, if that were possible, in the teachings of Jesus. and in the writings of Paul. And of course, in the Ten Commandments. And ultimately, of course, in the commandment that we were given to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Brothers and sisters, let us rejoice and live in the knowledge that God is truthful and merciful and wise. And let us grow through the teaching of his Holy Spirit into the opportunity for us to be truthful and wise and merciful. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your characteristics, all of them. Thank you so much that you are truthful and merciful and wise. Please, O oh God, help us to grow in those characteristics ourselves and help us to rely upon your truthfulness and mercy and wisdom. Help us to share that with all those whom we meet. 
Lord, guide us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.